Sometimes in wrestling, you can figure out what's going to happen next from a mile away. After all, we all knew when Hulk Hogan or John Cena would find a way to overcome the odds and stand tall by the end, or that Vince McMahon and any other number of authority figures would eventually get their comeuppance. But what happens when the story takes a twist that surprises us? Well, while we've looked at some of the worst examples of this over on a previous video on this channel, there have been plenty of great examples too. So join us today as we take a deep dive into the best of them in What a Twist! Wrestling's Greatest Swerves. And where better to start than with one of the greatest swerves of the modern era? Because after six years of speculating about whether or not someone would ever have the guts to do it, Seth Rollins finally became the first person to cash in the Money in the Bank contract during the main event of WrestleMania. Of course, this one would take place at WrestleMania 31 on March 25th, 2015 during a match where, on the face of it, it seemed like the WWE was in a no-win situation. And that's because on one side of the existing main event you had Roman Reigns, someone who was being primed to be the new face of the company, but who was being wildly rejected by the audience. Meanwhile, on the other side you had Brock Lesnar, the biggest heel in WWE and someone who had beaten just about everyone by that point. So perhaps realizing that neither man coming out the victor would send fans home happy, Vince McMahon decided to make a last-minute decision on the day of the event by having Rollins use the Money in the Bank contract he'd won some months prior to intervene. Yes, as the bout was coming to its close, Seth, who was at this point closely aligned with the authority after having turned his back on his Shield brothers earlier in the year, would run to the ring to a massive pop as fans finally realized the moment they'd been waiting for ever since the concept was first introduced was finally happening. Just a few minutes later then, and in what JBL would subsequently dub the heist of the century, the architect had pinned his former stablemate and was at the top of the entrance ramp swinging the WWE title over his head in celebration. Yes, even if he was a heel that night, the fact that he'd successfully cashed in was enough to send every fan home feeling like they'd seen something special. But it wasn't the first time a cash-in had surprised people, of course, because years prior to that, the first ever Money in the Bank contract holder, Edge, would set the template for this when he staked his claim at John Cena. Of course, at the time, this was a new concept to fans, and so it wasn't even clear how the contract cash-in would work at all until the moment it happened. Sure, everyone knew it granted the holder a title shot at the time of their choosing, but as far as most were concerned, this would mean booking a match and giving the existing champ an opportunity to prepare. So once Big Match John had spent almost half an hour surviving a grueling Elimination Chamber defense against Shawn Michaels, Kane, Kurt Angle, Carlito, and Chris Masters on January 8th, 2006's New Year's Revolution, he'd assume he was done for the night. Little did he know, however, that as he was sitting in the ring recovering, Vince McMahon would come out at the top of the entranceway, with him there announcing that Edge had decided that this was the best time to cash in his contract, and that the match would be taking place right there and now. Yes, living up to the nickname which would later be bestowed upon him, the ultimate opportunist chose his moment perfectly here. And that was why, with Cena barely able to defend himself anymore, less than two minutes later, he'd have lost the WWE title. Needless to say then, from there, Edge would become an instant main eventer, a position he continued to hold for the rest of his career thereafter. And what's more than that, this whole moment would solidify the Money in the Bank contract as being one of the most exciting things WWE had in their arsenal too, a gimmick so popular it's been used every year since. Yes, now that Edge had established it, the ability for a title to change hands could come at any time, as long as the challenger had that elusive briefcase that was. So from there, every year fans would wait patiently to see when the holder was going to cash it in, always wondering if that night would be the one. But while they were always on the lookout for this, one thing fans certainly weren't watching out for in 2014 was the breakup of the most popular stable the company had seen in years. That's right, we alluded to it earlier, but given how big and how successful a swerve it was, the night Seth Rollins turned on the shield really deserves its own entry. How did we get there though? After all, with them seemingly having a brotherly bond which could not be broken, the Hounds of Justice had been able to make WWE their own personal playground over the year prior to this. In fact, during this time they'd gone from hated heels to beloved babyfaces, all while beating just about everyone the company had thrown at them, with the names they'd gone through including the likes of John Cena, Randy Orton, and Daniel Bryan. That said, their biggest challenge yet would come in the spring of 2014, as it was then that Evolution would reform, with them at this point setting their sights on ridding the company of the Shield once and for all. 
So that was why two six-man tags would take place between the groups over the next couple of months, with Rollins, Reigns, and Dean Ambrose ending up winning both of these. Still though, always having a plan B in his back pocket, Triple H would get in the ear of Seth at this point, convincing him that if he split away from his Shield brothers and joined up with the heels, there would be far more opportunities for him. And choosing to believe this then, the former Ring of Honor World Champion would lay out Reigns and Ambrose with a steel chair on the June 2nd episode of Raw, all while his new boss, The Game, watched on in glee. Yes, from this point onwards, much to fans' dismay, The Architect would become the crown jewel in the Authority's crown. But that didn't mean that his now former stablemates were done with him because, looking for revenge, Dean Ambrose would spend the rest of the summer feuding with Rollins, seeking justice not only for what he'd taken away from his brothers, but also from the fans too. And of course, karma would eventually catch up to the betrayer here, though when it finally did so, it wouldn't be in the way that he or fans initially imagined. And that's because after going on a very successful run over the next couple of years and becoming a multiple-time WWE Champion in the process, the architect of the Shield's downfall would be betrayed himself by none other than Triple H. What was the reason for this? Well, by the August 22, 2016 episode of Raw, following Seth's loss to Finn Balor at SummerSlam the night prior, the game decided he'd built just about everything he could from Rollins, with him at this point deciding to pick a new guy in the form of Kevin Owens. So that was how, after Balor had to immediately relinquish his newly won Universal title as a result of an injury, a four-way match would be booked to crown a new champion, one which would include Roman Reigns, Big Cass, Kevin Owens, and of course, Seth Rollins. But while he may have thought his boss was going to help him come away from this one with the win, both The Architect and everyone else in the audience would be surprised when Triple H delivered a pedigree towards him at the close of the bout and instructed KO to pick up the win and the title instead. So after that, now shifting to the side of the babyfaces again, Rollins would begin an eight-month odyssey, one which eventually saw him get his hands on the game at WrestleMania 34 and finally defeat him one-on-one. -on -one. Of course, this was a bittersweet win for him though, as it meant losing a mentor in the process. But while that WrestleMania may have marked an important turning point in his career, it was nothing compared to the shift which had taken place for The Undertaker four years prior when, to the shock of absolutely everyone, the famed streak would finally come to an end. That's right, ever since his first match at the Showcase of the Immortals in 1991, there had been one constant in WWE, and that was, no matter what, The Undertaker's arm would be raised by the time WrestleMania was over. Even after Hogan had quit, even after Austin had retired, and The Rock had gone to Hollywood, the dead man would remain as the eternal figure of the company, always getting the victory at the biggest show of the year, no matter who he was going up against. That said, as has been well documented by this point, the first decade or so of his WrestleMania win streak was more coincidence than anything else, with it not being until the early 2000s that someone first mentioned to Mark Calloway that he had a special thing going on. So following the announcement of his match with Randy Orton at WrestleMania 21 in 2005, the streak would become an annual highlight of the show, with a new hungry challenger stepping up each and every year, hoping to be the one to finally slay the dragon. And while there were some close calls for the dead man throughout this period, at a certain point, with him having beaten the best of the best and getting closer and closer to retirement, it was assumed by many that he would never lose and that his undefeated WrestleMania streak would be his ultimate legacy. Of course, there was one man who had something to say about this, and that man was none other than the three-time WWE Champion and one-time UFC Heavyweight Champion, Brock Lesnar. Yes, after taking a lengthy sabbatical from wrestling to go conquer the world of MMA, The Beast would return to WWE in 2012 with an all-new aura of being an unstoppable killer emanating from him. Still though, even if this was Brock 2.0, few actually believed he would beat The Undertaker by the time their long-awaited match came about at WrestleMania 30 on April 6, 2014. After all, if anyone was going to end the streak, then it had always been assumed it would be a younger, up-and-coming star who needed the help to get to the next level. So when the bell rang and Lesnar quickly began to dominate then, fans may have been somewhat surprised, but still, they were still confident the result would come out okay in the end. That was until the Beast hit three F5s on his opponent and, to the absolute shock of everyone both in attendance and watching at home, pinned the dead man in the middle of the ring one, two, Three. Yes, it's since been called WWE's Red Wedding on account of how wild a moment it was, with the entire crowd of over 75,000 people being left unable to speak for the first few minutes after it happened. 
Many, in fact, assumed it was a mistake at first, with it not being until a graphic came up on the big screen reading 21 in 1 that it became clear that this was all part of the plan. So at this point, it started to sink in that the streak was over and that The Undertaker himself was mortal, a tough thing to accept for those who had grown up watching wrestling and having this be a comfort they could expect to see every year. But if that was the biggest shocker for those generation of fans, for the generation prior to Mark Calloway's debut with WWE, the biggest swerve was something entirely different, but no less seismic. And that was the time where, after having held on to the WWF title for 1,474 days, Hulk Hogan would finally be beaten by Andre the Giant. Of course, the reason this one was so shocking wasn't just because it was the Hulkster losing. No, it was the circumstances around it, because as it happened, it would all involve the Million Dollar Man, plastic surgery, and two twin referees. That's right, following Hogan and Andre's generation-defining showdown at WrestleMania 3, the rematch of the century would be booked for February 5th, 1988's The Main Event. And with the anticipation being higher than ever for this one then, a staggering 33 million Americans would tune in to watch, the highest TV ratings any wrestling show has ever gotten before, and likely will ever get in the future at this point. But while most expected to see another successful Hulk title defense here, they'd ultimately be swerved, because at the end of the bout, as Andre was pinning the champ, the referee would count the three, despite Hogan's shoulders not being down. Needless to say then, fans were immediately aware a screw job had taken place, and soon after this, they'd realize it had been Ted DiBiase behind it all along, as after the giant was given the title, he'd then sell it to the Million Dollar Man. Yes, enacting his plan perfectly, DiBiase would reveal here that he'd replaced the original referee, Dave Hebner, with an evil version who had been given plastic surgery so as to make him look like an exact doppelganger. Of course, in reality though, this doppelganger was actually Dave's twin brother, Earl, with this being the moment he was first introduced to WWF fans. But while the kayfabe plot had been successful in getting the belt off of Hogan, then on-screen company president Jack Tunney would not let the whole thing stand for long as pretty quickly afterwards, he'd strip DiBiase of the title and create a one-night tournament to crown a new champion. And this tournament would ultimately end up taking place at WrestleMania 4, with Macho Man Randy Savage coming out of that night as the new champ. Of course, this would also directly lead into the Mega Powers storyline, still one of the most successful in WWF history to this day. In fact, so successful was it, the company were still able to largely live off the fumes of it well into the early 90s, as with there not really being much else going on that was drawing in fans in large numbers at that point, they'd have to rely on nostalgia instead. That said, it would be a period which almost gave one of the better swerves of the era. And this was because it was in June of 1995 when the roadie was supposed to be revealed as the one singing Jeff Jarrett's With My Baby Tonight all along. And we say almost, because while this one had been teased for months prior, both men would ultimately quit the company before the whole thing could climax. Of course, had it gone as it was originally supposed to, Double J, who had been regularly claiming that he was the best country musician WWE had ever seen at this point, would have been embarrassed when an accidental curtain slip showed audiences he was just lip-syncing his hit single and that his assistant was the one really behind the vocals. From there then, the two would have feuded with each other for a while, with the by now babyface Rhodey presumably coming out on top come the end of things. But if this never actually happened on screen, we hear you ask, then why is it included in this video? Well, that's because eventually it was revealed on screen. That's right, when the Rhodey returned to the company the following year, now working under the name of Road Dog Jesse James, he'd immediately turn himself babyface by announcing that it had in fact been him who was singing Jarrett's song all along. That said, this wouldn't be enough to get him anywhere higher than the lower card for the immediate future. No, that rise wouldn't actually start until he began teaming up with current scissor enthusiast Billy Gunn in 1997, with the two at this point calling themselves the New Age Outlaws and going on to become one of the highlights of the Attitude Era. And it's during the Attitude Era that our next great swerve took place too as it happened, because after spending his first months in WWF as a hated heel, only to then get massively over as the cocky people's champion, no one saw it coming when The Rock decided to turn back to the dark side and join up with the corporation. But how could they? After all, as we said, at this point the Great One had only just turned babyface, and with his popularity growing to the point where it was threatening to eclipse even that of Stone Cold Steve Austin, it seemed like a crazy idea on the face of it. 
So when the WWF title was vacated in late 1998 then, with a new champion to be decided at that November Survivor Series Deadly Games tournament, it seemed like the only two options to win were the Rattlesnake or the Rock. And while fans were happy to have either one come out on top, none of them expected it to go down the way it did when, after Austin was eliminated in the semifinals, the People's Champion would turn on the People by aligning with Vince McMahon in the final, using this to help him beat Mankind. So from there, now rebranding himself as the Corporate Champion, The Rock would deny his fans what they wanted out of him each and every week, playing his role to perfection here as he stood as the final roadblock for Stone Cold to eventually overcome. Sure. Given how popular he was, this heel turn was always going to have an expiration date on it. But that didn't make it any less impactful when it happened, and any less worthy of being the closing moment to Vince Russo's finest hour as a booker. But while this represented a rare successful swerve from Russo, he unfortunately can't take any of the credit for our next entry. And that's because, by the time 2002 rolled around, he'd be long gone. So when hell froze over and Eric Bischoff joined WWE, it would be all Vince McMahon's idea. Of course, what an idea this was though, because given how bitter the Monday Night Wars had gotten towards the end, there was absolutely no one who believed Eazy-E had any chance of showing up in a WWE ring at that point in time. After all, he'd actively tried to put the company out of business, and even gone as far as to regularly give away the results of their show on his own TV. Still, ever the businessman, McMahon was able to look past this and see money in the idea of taking his most hated enemy and turning him into a co-worker. And so, it was then that on the July 16th episode of Raw that year, just after he'd pulled the plug on the NWO once and for all, the boss would announce that he was appointing a new general manager in charge of the Red Brand. Then, just seconds after that, it would be revealed that Bischoff himself was the general manager, with this leading to a sight most fans thought they would never see, as he and McMahon embraced each other on the top of the ramp. Seriously, if you were a wrestling fan during the late 90s, this was the equivalent of having Batman and the Joker suddenly become best friends. So needless to say then, everyone watching was shocked, and they were even more shocked as the weeks went on and it became apparent that Bischoff was not going anywhere. But for as shocking as that may have been, there's another swerve that's even better and may go down as the greatest of all time. Yes, we're talking about the time Mark Henry faked his retirement and proved that, despite what his naysayers might have you believe, he really was that great. But for some context here, by the time 2013 rolled around, the world's strongest man had spent almost two decades on the WWE roster. And while he'd been a regular fixture on TV throughout this period, the general consensus was that he'd largely failed to live up to the expectations that were set for him as the world's strongest man. Sure, he'd had a successful run as World Heavyweight Champion with his Hall of Pain gimmick in 2011 and 2012, but after that, it was assumed he had nothing else left in the tank. So when he came out on the June 17th episode of Raw to announce his retirement from the ring then, most people took it at face value. And as he stood there in a now famous salmon jacket, all while John Cena was on the ring apron, the fans in attendance showered him with all the love and adoration that was to be expected for any popular figure who was deciding to call it a day. Of course, what they didn't expect was that, after delivering a speech for the ages that proved he was a far better orator than most had given him credit for, he'd immediately swerve everyone by body slamming Big Match John and revealing that not only was he not going anywhere, but he was coming for the title. Yes, no one saw this coming, and in the end, that's what made it so special. In fact, at this point, it's probably going to go down as the most memorable part of Mark Henry's career overall, and helped to ensure that the inductor of the Hall of Pain ended up in its rightful place of the Hall of Fame.